I think I went into, well, I know I went into developmental psychology because of an interest in human behavior and what motivates that behavior. When I was a kid, I was always wanted to be a policewoman or a lawyer or a judge, and I thought that was pretty warped even as a kid, until later I realized it was that interest in why people do what they do and so on. So by the time I went to college, I was convinced I was going to be a social worker. But the first couple of classes, I realized I'd be a dismal social worker, and that wouldn't work at all. But I felt sort of that's what I'd chosen. I had to get out in four years. I was on scholarship, and I didn't understand how easily one can change majors and move around. But a psychology professor uh, asked me into his office and said, do you want to change your major to psych and go into the honors program? And I leapt at it, because every time anybody had talked about anything very interesting over in sociology, was um, they always stopped and said, but that's the purview of the people over there pointing to the psych department. And I thought, that's, that's, that's what interests me. So I had a great deal of psychology that last three semesters, but it was wonderful, and I went right on to graduate school because there's not a lot you can do in that field with a bachelor's, and uh, chose the area of human development there. And when I graduated, um, I did not want to go into teaching, and I knew that, and so I got, kept turned down the position I had been um, offered in that area, and I thought, no, I'm, I'm going to risk it. I want to do something else. And got a wonderful opportunity to do research clinical work at Johns Hopkins Medical Center, and that project moved on up to Harvard's Medical Center, and I really enjoyed that work. In fact, I remember writing home saying, I can't believe they're paying me to do this. This is so much fun. So I knew that that had been the right field and right choice. I was adamant that I never wanted to go into teaching, even as a child. My whole family was teachers, and I wanted to do something different, and that's all it was based on, I think, is wanting to do something different. Um, and so I wasn't going to do it, no matter what. found a position that I thought I'd stay with, but I wanted to come back to Colorado, and my boss helped me um, get a position at one of the Denver hospitals doing much the same sort of work, but it was soft money, and so I was back at Colorado, and it turned out the position was not funded because the grant hadn't come through. So there I was in Colorado. I could have gone back to my old position, but I really wanted to stay in Colorado, out of job, out of um, getting out of money very quickly, sleeping on my brother's couch, so I was ready to do any position that I could get. But I, it was only a month, it seemed at that age, forever, uh, that I was out of work. And I was just tired of looking for work. And I went up to Fort Collins and CSU to meet a counselor that I'd worked with at Cornell, just socially. Had too naive to think about networking or jobs. I just wanted to have a day off. And uh, the college at that time had a unit of child development where they'd lost two professors. And they were desperate because... Um, Nan Hoddick, the associate dean, was having to cover those classes. And so uh, I was offered a position. I said, oh, I'd love to do it. <laughs> you know? And she knew I didn't want to. I'd worked with her at Cornell. She knew I'd said I wouldn't touch it. So she took great delight in my utter enthusiasm and enjoyment after just a couple of weeks of doing it, of working with college students, being back on a campus, getting to share my interest in my field. It was heaven. And I knew that fairly soon. That's what I wanted to do. So after about four years, I went back to Cornell for my doctorate, knowing that's, that's the career I wanted to pursue, teaching at a university level. Were your family <laughs> so constantly sure. saying, I told you so? Uh, <laughs> not so much. <laughs> they just thought, oh, well, whatever. <laughs> uh, I don't know if they knew I was as adamant against it as, because uh, I didn't voice it to them. That was their passion and interest, so I just some more quietly said, I'm not going there. I'm going to do something more interesting. <laughs> so, and you talked to Janet about um, that you just knew you were interested in, in why people do what they do. Do you know what, do you have any thoughts about or memories about what triggered that interest for you? What 
created that interest? I, I really don't know. I was never interested in abnormal behavior. It really was just normal, transitional, normative behavior. And uh, that's a good question, but I know I never, never really understood what maybe brought mm -hmm. that on. It's just yeah. my interest. <laughs> And it's remained my interest. I love mysteries. It's my favorite reading. <laughs> well, the, not the academic reading, the, uh, just a good mystery. And when you think about it, those mysteries are somebody did something and the whole thing is not only who did it, but why did they do it? And you figure out who did it by why it happened. I had many great professors at Cornell, but Yuri Braun from Brenner was... Um, one professor, he's well known in our field, he developed one of the major theoretical frameworks within our field, but all of the graduate students in my master's program were required to take his introductory class in human development. And um, it was an undergraduate class and we were quite put out about it. We thought we were far beyond that. Um, but took, took the class and it was only uh, after I was teaching, I realized I was falling back again and again and again on both how he introduced content and how he taught um, looking at uh, the scientific questions and pulling them apart and how, and how he could take an auditorium of students, and that's what it was, and make them feel like they were in a small seminar just with him. He was a superb professor. And I realized we were being given a seminar in college teaching without them telling us what they did. So even when I went back for the doctorate, I sat in on a number of his classes because then I could really appreciate uh, what he was doing and get newer ideas. And so he was, uh, he was uh, very instrumental in helping me structure my first classes. I came at a wonderful time with the department being so young. And so I really was able to help shape the curriculum and of the department, I and, and other colleagues, but I started the first lifespan course on campus. I had to argue for it and got it in. And uh, a number of courses in cognitive development and cross-cultural development and so on. But several of us who were new at that time, really we could shape that department since it was so new and growing fast was a lot of opportunity rather than coming into a department that had a set curriculum. So that was fun. I think one of the things I'm probably most proud of in the programmatic area actually started as my being taught by an undergraduate about a career field I had never even heard about, even though I worked in hospitals. And that was being a child life specialist. And these are individuals who work with the psychosocial care of hospitalized children. And um, this student wanted to do an internship, I began um, in that area supervising interns because I'd worked in hospitals. And then I joined the National Association because I wanted to educate myself more in the field. And that um, led to me being able to be part of a group that fought to require that anybody working in that field had to pass a national certification exam. And I even got to help develop that first certification exam. And we became a nationally recognized program for the quality of our undergraduates and graduate students in that field. Three of them have gone on to be president of the association. Um, students are practicing all over the country in it. and So that was a real rewarding programmatic. I had been interested in, uh, in including cross-cultural perspectives in my classes from traveling, but what it was really CSU and some of the opportunities that just turned that into a major interest of mine. It probably started with a grant, uh, Fulbright study grant, that was that the university had for faculty to take their area of interest and study uh, in India for a period of time and and uh, relate it. So we had a year preparatory seminar on Indian history, culture, and so on. My interest was on the socialization of children within rural Hindu families. And each of the faculty members who went had an interest in their particular field. There were 14 CSU faculty who went. 
And uh, we had six weeks in India. It doesn't sound like much, but what was opened up by the government of India for us, we had lectures by Indian professors, tremendous cultural and, and travel experiences. We went to so many agencies and talked to so many professionals that you know, I never would have had access to on my own. And then I think probably the biggest thrill was being able to have a somewhat lengthy discussion with both Mother Teresa and Indira Gandhi at two separate, and then never forgotten those experiences, of course. And um, our role was to bring it back and um, include that material in our classes, and also to teach the India classes or facilitate the India classes of those faculty members who'd gone on that grant in an earlier grant for the students at CSU. And I think that started just my looking at the importance of how that informed my um, own work and generally in human development. I had an opportunity then to go to Russia and later to Poland working with academics on different issues. And the cultural experience, cross-cultural experience, was more potent than the academic content that uh, I gained. And my last experience um, was, again, a grant that Alicia Cook got on internationalizing the curriculum at CSU. And a number of faculty, we came together for a year sharing our expertise and how we, the issues we were working with in our classes. But it also included a chance to have a field experience. And I uh, went to Kenya, western rural Kenya, where uh, we were working with AIDS orphans with the, through an NGO um, who had lost their parents but were caring and trying to keep the family together. And I was particularly interested in the resilience of these kids in these traumatic circumstances and how they coped. And it just, it, not only informed by students in my classes and, and some of the research I did based on that international, but just the opening your eyes to the issues of developing nations and I think also just the unexpected joys um, and, it, and it being so impressed with how individuals can cope in situations like that. For example, in Kenya, um, I knew I'd be working with orphans, uh, either in orphanages that the village was helping care for or within um, on their own, trying to keep it. But I was totally surprised by the first family I visited. It's not what I imagined, not what I expected. Um, m much of the AIDS deaths are really university-educated and middle-class individuals, more than rural, f rural families. But this family, um, th the father and two mothers had both died. Um, polygamy was practiced in that part of Kenya. And there were five children, and the oldest was a male who was attending university in the States. And they wanted to keep him there because it was the only source, real source of any money. He could work and get some money to them. The two oldest girls, the oldest daughter, had just completed her college degree in French and wanted to work for the airlines. That had been her goal. And the second daughter had just finished high school and, wanted to, and had been accepted to college. Neither one could pursue those dreams. They dropped out, they came back to care for the two younger boys who had dropped out of school because they were caring for their father before he died and they were the only source of income they could get was picking up bottles and glass and so on during the day. And they, the daughters knew those sons needed to get into school and they needed to earn money to pay for their school uniforms and get them in school. And so here's a family that my students could relate to. And these five children were trying to, the older children raising the younger children and giving up their dreams. And it was, it was just an experience filled with stories uh, like that, that just really has changed my whole interest in keeping up with international affairs and travel, wanting to travel more and so on. Just what, how we grow and being in totally different culture. I think what got me so involved in faculty governance was just curiosity. I had been the departmental rep to faculty council and I noticed, wait a minute, all the decisions really had been made before we got there for the meeting. 
And so I then became the college representative to the executive committee. It used to be called the steering committee. And it was um, also the feeling like the decisions are mainly made before we're even discussing this. What is the function of faculty center, faculty council, if, if the decisions aren't made at that point? And worked with a group of faculty who really wanted to change the model that CSU had where the provost chaired the council. And most universities in the states didn't have that model. A faculty member on a elected faculty member for a short term would chair the senate or council. Well, we worked for that and suddenly the central administration agreed and we had it and we didn't know what to do with it. Here we were um, with the okay, but not many people wanted to. There wasn't much release time to speak of and there would be a lot of work and a, and a lot of stress because we knew that what happened those first couple of years would mean whether that could remain that way or not. But uh, Harry Rosenberg in the history department agreed to be the first chair, or was elected to be the first chair. And uh, I was urged to be the vice chair. And I thought, I don't want to do this. But on the other hand, how can you vote and argue for something for several years and say, but not me, somebody <laughs> else. That's kind of like not in my neighborhood. <laughs> and so I agreed to do it. And I'm very glad I did it. I had two years as vice chair and then went, became chair. So that's the only reason I was the first woman chair. And then we have a year of folding chair because issues go on that, that uh, you're privy to and need to help explain on the executive committee. But I was, I learned so much about the university as an institution as opposed to my department at college level. I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed all the colleagues across campus in different fields I met and really terrific people. Many of them became good friends. And that I enjoyed and I enjoyed working around the state because the various um, universities and, and um, community colleges work together with the faculty senate chairs. That was enjoyable in terms of higher education in Colorado. But at the end of it, I took a sabbatical <laughs> and went to the University of Cambridge in England as a visiting scholar so I could get back into my own research and my own reading, which had just had to be shelved for those five years. And I came back to my department really refreshed, really happy to be back doing research and teaching in my own discipline. And so I think that experience really shaped the whole rest of my time at CSU in terms of being much more aware and interested in what was going on in the university as a whole. So I'm glad I did it. Uh, well, it's been really gratifying to hear from a number of people, students who've graduated or colleagues who say I was a mentor. And it's caused me to think because I never consciously mentored anybody. And in thinking about it, I think what it is, is that um, I just enjoyed so many of my students and so many of my colleagues. So sitting down, talking about goals and talking about ideas of how to reach those goals really was it that exciting collegial work that was one of the best parts of the job. And so it wasn't in my mind mentoring, it was just sharing ideas. and. I, there certainly were the uh, talented undergraduate students that all of us would, or most of us would, try and nurture with opportunities so they could get into a strong graduate program or uh, a good job. And um, same with colleagues, uh, junior colleagues, and we abhorred that name in our department, junior and senior, and tried to fight it all the time. But to help them in the tenure and promotion process, and I was chair of tenure promotion for quite a while and so had a lot of that. and then. Um, helping with grant reviews with colleagues and so on. But most everybody I knew as faculty did exactly the same thing. So it's really less the mentoring and more just the collegial work that uh, that many, if, if you don't enjoy collegial and collaborative work, then maybe you do less of that. But if you do, that's just, I think it's seen sometimes as mentoring, but but I think of it as just collegial sharing. People have often asked whether you like your research more than the teaching or the teaching more than the research because it's always a balance. But I never could answer that because I saw them so intertwined. You know, even at the undergraduate level, I think what I um, wanted to work on the most was um, respecting the students enough 
to not simplify the material because to let them see the complexities in our field and have them grapple with that, not oversimplify it, and teach them to be really critical of the published research in our field so they could select what was going to be programmatically helpful to them. And in the same way, to be able to use the theories effectively in their programming. And so that was some of the research that was going on that you would share and the, the struggles within the research so that they could see uh, what really went into those and not just take the abstract and say, oh, got the answer there. And, uh, and same way with graduate students, it was such fun working with them with the research because if they were RAs, you were teaching them research data analysis procedures and so on. And uh, many of our graduate students worked with, uh, particularly the DARE-DBU project, to uh, use the data in answering questions. And so you were teaching them there. And, and the same with graduate students, just the joy of letting them take their, their interest and helping them develop a researchable idea and then develop it into a strong study, solid thesis was uh, a lot of joy. So what was teaching and what was research really was so intermingled that it was sort of one pie. It was hard to, at times I felt I was being cut up into too many pieces, but if it worked well, it was one pie. I, I think I've often um, wondered if I didn't want university teaching also because I saw what went on in a number of medical schools and universities that I was working at in one way or another. Um, it's got to be pretty cutthroat and pretty um, um, unpleasant in terms of some of the interactions. And I was just so lucky. I'm coming to a young department that grew rapidly. Um, most of us were young, fairly soon out of our graduate programs. We were taken on the world. <laughs> we had a college that was supportive of us and to really shape a program and do what we wanted. And so <clears throat> some of that collegiality began because we were friends and we came in about the same time. But it shaped the department to be supportive of each other. That We were friends. We were glad to go and see each other at work. We were happy about each other's success. We liked working collaboratively. Um, and as the department matured, I saw some of that change a little bit as you got faculty coming in much further along in their career and so on and had their uh, way of doing things, but it never lost that, that I, and I don't think it still has that sort of sense of uh, we're here to support each other and cheer each other on, and that just makes going to work really pleasant. <laughs> and I think uh, I, another thing that I think about that is over that, it wasn't just the, col uh, the department. The college had a lot of support, and I realized over my tenure I had five different department heads and five different deans and I think back every one of them was incredibly supportive to me. They let me go my own way, they let me try out new ideas that were risky and I knew they had my back that I wasn't going to be second guessed if it didn't work. And how remarkable is that that, that you can have um, people who are evaluating you or making decisions about your tenure promotion and so on that are that supportive um, to, a, to a one. Every one of them was. Yeah, so I was lucky. I was very lucky even to have a career at CSU. I think I was just very lucky to come in at a time where there was so much um, growth and change, so it kept the job very interesting. Uh, I, if people said, why did you stay so long in one place. It's sort of implying, are you lazy and you just didn't want to risk going somewhere else? And I had to always say, it, it's not the same place. It kept growing and changing within the department. Um, different aspects that I did, such as faculty governance or the international work, made it a different kind of job. Um, so that, that was, um, a time and place that, that kept me invested. And then, because of the support that the college uh, and the department gave me, you know, it, it, it was a, a place that you felt you owed your efforts for them because they were 
giving you so many opportunities like the international travel and the um, programmatic uh, ability to affect curriculum and so on. So, I think it's because I had scholarship help. The, the scholarship help is something I want to commit to because I went all the way through school with scholarship help or assistantships or uh, teaching assistantships or research assistantships. Uh, later on, and it was sort of like, what do you mean you pay for your education? <laughs> and when I see what students are having to pay for their education now, compared to what I was lucky enough to have, I want to help in that area. I did research in a number of areas, but one area I spent a fair amount of time on was the uh, research evaluation, research component of a program called Dare to Be You, which was started by Jan Moore Heil, an extension specialist in the college. And um, the DARE part stands for decision making, which related to teaching uh, children uh, problem solving. And uh, uh, A is assertiveness, the social skills training. Um, R was responsibility or an internal locus of control. And E was self-esteem, self-efficacy, empathy for others. And it was a program designed for teachers of children, for parents, of children. It uh, has been done. It's a model program nationally now. Um, we've had uh, groups from different ethnicities, different regions of the country, um, great, great variety. And um, became very, we started as external reviewers, became very invested in the, in the quality of the program. And it just really uh, was in interesting and enjoyable to stay with a project that long. It generated a lot of data for our students but, and, and publications and so on, but it was um, also a joy just to see the effect it had as a, in basically a service project in terms of programs around the state and, and nationwide, in terms of really helping parents and teachers working with young children to um, have them better able to resist some of the challenges they were going to have. So it's a preventative program for, for problem behaviors and, and really believe in the prevention rather than the intervention side of the equation. I think the stories that pop to mind is more often graduate students who had to talk me into twisting my arm to chair them in an area I wasn't interested in and their persistence. One was um, uh, you know, one wanted me to work with some of the aspects of um, adult adoptees in search of their parents. And um, it had a cognitive component, but it, it wasn't my area, and, it, I, and I didn't want to read about that and get involved in it. And I kept saying, no, 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 and I thought it perfect out. I was going to tell her, you get a sample, and I had been telling her, you can't get a big enough sample here to make a, a respectable study. You get a big enough sample and I'll chair it. Mm -hmm. Never assuming she could do that. Well, she spent a year in Denver working with the adult adoptees group, got their trust, got their willingness to use their contacts to get a very large and representative sample. So there I was, stuck. Mm -hmm. And so I had to immerse myself in that literature and work with her through that. We gave, we wrote on it, we gave papers on it, and she went on to graduate school in an area of cognitive development, which I would have loved to have worked with her with, but I went on and um, did some more work on that area. And so there's been a number of graduate students, and I felt with a master's students, you went with their area of interest and taught them the research method, rather than insist they do exactly what you were doing. And you capture their excitement about research if they care about the topic more. And uh, it was more than once, uh, it was a grad student's interest that I then had to spend a little more time on the issue after they'd left and gone on for their doctorate or gone on to work because of what they introduced to me. So again, that venering goes two ways. They got me interested in something new and I helped them get on to the next stage of their career.